we find that um, we, in our natural mind, may be uh, quite convinced that something is bad, when in actual fact it's neither bad nor good, it's how we respond to it. And we may find that, that um, something is, is quite neutral in its actual um, content or its impact. And, and all we have to do is learn to, be, um, to respond in a way that, that uh, will allow um, God to communicate to us what he wants to communicate. And sometimes he wants us to learn something. Um, sometimes he wants us to understand something from his perspective. Um, you know, some people think that they've got all the answers, certain temperaments, certain motivations. Um, they tend to be the sort of people who, um, they always know what to do, and no, no matter what circumstances we uh, encounter, they, they always have the answer. Um, and, and for those people, sometimes it, they need to learn to ask God before they make up their mind. Um, for others who are more doubtful <laughs> as, you know, to the other extreme, they need to be more listening and then when they hear from God to be more firm and hanging on to what God is saying to them. And so everybody's different and will be impacted differently. But we need to, to understand that in the natural realm, no matter how many times you can know good from evil, you've figured it out, don't think that you're going to always know because you can only know good or evil when God tells you it's good or evil. You know, um, just a simple illustration of that is um, a parent may be giving uh, a child's backside a bit of a dusting and uh, the child thinks it's really evil and the parent thinks it's really good. Um, good for the child to learn. But the child is experiencing pain and uh, probably the parent's uh, experiencing relief from frustration. But uh, the, the outcome is good for that child, hopefully, as long as the child has the right attitude towards discipline. In Romans chapter 9, verse 1, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience, enlightened and prompted by the Holy Spirit, bearing witness within me. And that's from the Amplified Bible, as you recognize. So here he is saying that his conscience, you see, if we're sensitive to God, our conscience will be sensitive to God. And God speaks to us in our conscience. And we need to not have a conscience. When I was in the, the bakery and uh, we used to... Uh, uh, through constant use of the, uh, you know, with the hot tins and one thing and another, we had a lot of calluses on our hands and uh, we could pick up hot tins and we wouldn't hang on to them very long, but we could move them from one place to another if we needed to because we had these, this thick callus on our hands and, and we're able to do that. And uh, even to this day, I've still got calluses and I on my hands that I haven't disappeared uh, after all those years of being in a soft profession like the ministry. Um, but the fact is that uh, they were much harder and much thicker when I was, was younger. And you see, our conscience can become calloused, seared with a hot iron, the scripture puts it. And, and we we, we don't hear, we don't sense the Spirit of God communicating to us because we don't really want to hear God speak to us. And the problem with that is we may not want to hear God speak to us about some specific thing, but because we've built, as it were, a, a wall or a callous um, 
a hardness of heart towards God in that specific area, it may only be just a little micro area in our life, the trouble is it hardens our heart towards hearing God speak to us in all areas. And so we need to understand that surrender of our life um, is something that we can't be, I'll surrender in this bit, I won't surrender in that bit. Um, I'll surrender three quarters in that area, but you know, only half in that area. We, we don't have the right to choose because if we do, our conscience will be to some extent inhibited and so we don't hear the voice of God. The Amplified Bible says here that uh, the Holy Spirit assures us through, the con through our conscience when we are speaking the truth as imparted by him. In Psalm 16, verse 7, I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night my heart, my conscience instructs me. So God speaks through our conscience even at night during the, the, our uh, sleeping time. God is at work speaking to us, speaking to our conscience. How many of you have, have laid your head on the pillow and you're laying there and you're just thinking nice, counting sheep and so forth, and suddenly the Holy Spirit brings to mind some nasty little incident. It may only be just the size of a pin of, pinhead, but he brings it to your remembrance and you think, oh! But he wants you to deal with it. He counsels you. And even at night in your heart, and sometimes as you're waking in the morning, the same thing can happen. In those going to sleep and waking up moments, the Holy Spirit has you there and can speak to you. Don't push him away. Because if you push him away, you know, you resist him in those areas, you'll find that him harder to hear in other areas. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, As for you, the anointing you have received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Well, why am I doing this then? <laughs> okay. But as his anointing teaches you about all, these, all, all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. What's this saying is this. The Holy Spirit is inside of you saying, yes, no, yes. As you listen to people speak, he is telling you what is correct and what is incorrect. And so if we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit and, and inside we have this, sometimes it's a, just an awareness or sometimes it's a feeling or an emotion that comes along and, and we just feel uncomfortable with that particular aspect of what somebody has said, then often that can be uh, the Holy Spirit saying, you need to examine that, you need to look at that more thoroughly. However, I need to say to you, some people come in to our church and you know because they've never been in a church like ours that believe in the new creation and preach the word in the way that we do and the gifts of the spirit and so they get upset they get upset with what is presented and what is said because they don't understand what it is Yes, and they need to go away and search the scriptures and do what the, the Bereans did. They searched the scriptures to see whether the things that Paul was saying were true. And so just because you get upset doesn't mean to say it's the Holy Spirit saying, this is wrong. It may simply be is saying, you need to look at that and examine that from God's perspective, not just your own perspective. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is teaching you. The Holy Spirit's anointing, his presence and ability is in you. 
teaching you all things. We need to... One of the things about the new creation is that we know we live in Christ and Christ lives in us. We can't understand that, but the fact of the matter is it's the truth and it'll set us free. And we need to understand it and grasp it to its full measure. Otherwise, we find that we may miss out. 1 John chapter 3 and verses 19 through 21. This then is how we know we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. Sometimes, you know, um, when you first become a Christian or maybe as time goes on, you know, it's a bit like, being a Christian is a bit like washing. You know, you wash a, a garment and you think, that garment is clean. And then you get it out in the sunlight or in a bright light and you say, no, it's still grey. It's not white. It needs another wash. Um, it may, maybe needs the collar scrubbing so that you get that grubby, greasy mark of, off the neck of the collar. And, and so, you know, we, we experience something and we think, ah, I've, I'm washed in the blood. <laughs> but there are still attitudes lurking in our heart and mind and we need to allow God to wash deeper into our heart and mind and get rid of those things that would cause us to stumble. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And sometimes when the Spirit of God is working on something in our lives, um, he can bring it up and bring it up and bring it up and, and we think to ourselves, well, surely i am fixed that up I've asked for forgiveness. It's not forgiveness that he's worried about. He's asked, you know, he's wanting to cleanse you deep down, to set you free deep down of attitudes that would trip you up at some time in the future. So the Holy Spirit is constantly at work. And this is how we know he's at work because he does these things in our lives. And it helps us to understand how we can be sure that we're hearing God's voice. And, uh, you know, sometimes we think it's the devil. <laughs> but it's God gently but persistently pursuing us on a matter that needs to be dealt with and us to be set free from. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, it says, It is the Spirit who bears witness. He testifies because the Spirit is truth. And so he is in there saying, yes, that's right. Come on, preach it. <laughs> and he's going for it inside us. And then in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. So once again, the Holy Spirit is testifying within us. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given him concerning his son. So what this is basically saying is that uh, when the Holy Spirit is uh, talking to us, we've got to believe the Holy Spirit. When he comes and says to you, now you've committed your life to Christ, you're a child of God. And we say, I don't feel any different. And God says, it doesn't matter how you feel, it's a matter how you faith and faith up to it, and get into it, and be, be what God's word says. In Mark's gospel, chapter 13, verse 11, and some of you may say, but this is not talking about hearing from God. Yes, it is, if in the broadest sense. But do not worry beforehand what to say when you're dragged into the synagogue, or, you know, into court. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. So you don't, don't worry about it. God will come through as you trust him, as you learn to just rely upon him. And I've had that happen on many occasions. And 1 Corinthians 14, 29, two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. So there's a sense in which when somebody speaks prophet 
prophetically or prophets speak, we have this right and responsibility to weigh. Does this line up with the Word of God? Is this in harmony with the thrust of Scripture? Is this uh, in, in, uh, in line with what the Bible says? Okay. Now, um, people... I uh, really need to get back to the notes here. Um, so, how can we be sure? We've done all of that. Um, now, action point. Having heard the foregoing section, are you aware that God speaks to you in these ways? Have you experienced, as I was speaking to you, were you aware that God's spoken to you in any of those ways? Um, you can nod your head. If it falls off, I'll pray for you. Okay. Um, so maybe you can just break up, if you could just pause there uh, on the filming. Um, we could just break up and go and, and sit with somebody, not a relative. Not far away. Okay, most Christians have heard God. If I were to ask you, has God ever stopped you from doing something or rebuked you for doing something, um, you shouldn't have done, what would your answer be? Nearly everyone has perceived the rebuke of God at some time or other. If, he, if we can hear God rebuke us, why not expect to hear him speak good, positive, uplifting and encouraging things to us? After all, he is a good God who loves his children and wants to spend time with us. People are so... They have programmed their mind to think that God is always watching over them to wrap them over the knuckles if they get it wrong. Let me tell you, he is far more interested in you getting it right. And uh, have you ever heard of the book, The Two-Minute Manager? This, it's a book, just a thin book, and it encourages managers to go around encouraging people, seeing them for doing good things. And, uh, you know, that's a great idea and we need to understand that's how God operates. He is always watching over you and wanting to encourage you when you do something well. And some, some people are so negatively programmed, some believers, that even if God did say and they were to hear him say, you did such a good job then, they would say, Oh, well, it wasn't me, it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> They'd sort of blame the Holy Spirit for getting it right and blame themselves for getting it wrong. Um, we've got to be prepared to be encouraged, to receive encouragement. We've got to receive uh, love, you've got to receive encouragement. Uh, how people receive natural and spiritual information. Now, God, when he created mankind, didn't create you with a spiritual thing in your head and a natural part of your brain in your head. Um, you know, people would love to think. In actual fact, Liz and I were up in Queensland and they had a little note in their newsletter about this uh, doctor who had uh, discovered that um, when we speak positively, it actually sends endorphins around and makes us feel good. And that when you pray in tongues for an extended period of time, that same process happens in your brain. And so as you're, you're praying in the spirit, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes in length, um, you're actually making, you know, doing yourself good as far as your body is concerned because it's sending the uh, little in... Uh, feel-good endorphins running around your body and making you feel good. And so um, this doctor was saying that this, he's actually studied it and, and they've done, come up with these conclusions. Um, but you see, we are one, or what I was going to say, this uh, little snippet in the, the newsletter of the church we were visiting on holidays actually said that he had discovered that there was a part of the brain that was only used by the Holy Spirit and that was erroneous. Um, that was completely untrue 
um, because, and you know, it would have been so wonderful to go around saying there's a bit of your brain that only the Holy Spirit uses um, and makes us feel, you know, something special. We are special, come on. Um, but you don't have to have that happen to make you feel special. God uses the way you are created, how he created you, to actually allow you to gather data in the natural realm and in the spiritual realm. The way you gather data in the natural realm will be the way you gather to a great extent data in the spiritual realm. He doesn't use an entirely different set of facilities in your brain to do it. He uses the same set of principles. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 46, it says, first the natural, then the spiritual. The natural realm reveals the principles of the spiritual realm because that which is natural is built on that which is spiritual. It's through our sensory percepts, perceptors we receive information either in the natural world or the spiritual realm. The majority of people receive most information either natural or spiritual through a combination of the following three means. Okay. So, visually, and uh, I'm sorry you don't have that in your notes, but somehow or other they got lost and they've never been able to put them in for whatever reason. Through the eye gate, learning by seeing and watching, using strong visual associations. And the little picture there is with the big eyes to help you remember. We, we see pictures. Not everybody sees pictures with the same frequency, but that's how some of you, will, this will be your prime means of gathering information in the natural realm and it'll be the same way in the spiritual realm to some extent. Auditarily, um, through the ear gate, learning by listening to verbal instructions, remembering by forming the sounds. These words are all written there and on, the, on your thing, but the pictures are missing, that's all. Um, includes those who prefer to have it written down than to have someone show it to them. When I, Liz and I went to New Zealand one time to Wellington, uh, visiting the church there, and we uh, were brought to a, to a house where we were going to stay for the weekend, and, or for the week actually. Uh, we were ministering there for an extended period of time. And, you know, the two pastors that were there, one said to us, um, I'll write down the instructions. And the other said, I'll draw you a map. And, uh, you know, how would you feel? Which would you be wanting, the instructions or the map? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, we need, we need to um, recognise that some of us would probably prefer dominantly the map or some of us would prefer the written instructions. And these two men were just showing where they were coming from because they were doing it their way, the way that was most natural to them, and they thought that their way would be beneficial to us. Um, but I was waiting for the map <laughs> to be able to uh, see where I could go because I'm primarily a visual person. The kinesthetic or tactile person, um, they, that means through feelings and emotions, hands-on learning by becoming involved and actually doing something with what is being learnt. Uh, even if the action is as simple as pacing while reading or memorising, the more kinesthetic learner will remember best what he has learned while on the move. And, uh, you know, for some people... Just twiddling a pencil is, is enough movement to help them to learn. I was giving this lecture at Endeavour Hills and, uh, years ago and there was this girl, she was sitting over on my left, they had these three tables and she was on that table over there and she was, uh, all the time I was talking, she 
would have a pencil or she'd put that down and she'd pick up her ruler and, and she'd be just playing with it. Now, when I went to school, if you did that, you got your knuckles wrapped with a three-foot rule. Um, but you see, they didn't understand then like they are supposed to understand now. You're, they teach this. They were teaching it then, but they were not teaching it with the same emphasis. There may be some people who learn best, and um, Phil and Leanne's youngest, he is very kinesthetic, and he, he is constantly on the move. You think he was, you know, he had ants in his pants sometimes, but it's not that at all. He is listening, and he could probably repeat back many times word for word what's been said. It's just that unless he moves, he can't absorb it. Unless there is some movement, uh, that he finds it difficult to retain that piece of data. And, and we need to understand and accept. Now, in a classroom, you've got certain kids who are more kinesthetic. Put them up the back where they're not going to distract the more visual people. And, and so that they, they, they can be doing their thing, playing, you know, sort of, as long as they're not misbehaving, as long as they're concentrating, um, then you, they're not, uh, they can move and, and gain the knowledge through their memorising through movement. Another type of name for this type of, rec another name for this type of recognition is tactile. Now the pictures that you've seen, the Wayne Vincent, some of you know Wayne, um, he drew those pictures back in 1998 for me and uh, we've used them ever since. God uses the same faculties that we have in the natural, in the spiritual realm. And so what I'm going to do is an exercise, a little exercise with you now. Just want you, I'm going to ask you a question. The, question, the answer to the question is irrelevant. What is it? Irrelevant. irrelevant. And it means it doesn't have any consequence uh, what I want you to observe is how did you get to that answer? Did you get visually? Did you get tactile? Did you get uh, auditorily? Okay, how did it come to you, the answer? So you'll have...